Belgium defeat the defending champion Portugal and Cristiano Ronaldo bow out of Euro 2020 and the Czech Republic stun the Netherlands. We also have preview for Monday as Croatia face Spain and France face Switzerland. Jimmy Conrad with the betting tips, analysis and so much more. Kigo Lasso begins right now. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Kego Lasso. Another great day at Euro 2020. Another great day with the one and only Jimmy Conrad. Jimmy C, how are you, my man? I'm doing great, LME. It's great to see you again. I missed you yesterday, even though our producer, Lisa Roman, held it down. She's awesome. She, listen, man, she killed it. And I, I made my bosses write something in the contract to say, whatever happens, I don't care how popular Lisa gets, I st- keep st- my gig. Because uh, <laughs> she, she was too good, man. Lisa Roman absolutely killed it yesterday. Thank you so much, Lisa. Plenty more to come, by the way, from her, as many more projects will arrive in the future. And Jimmy, thank you so much for holding the four down, my friend. But today, special times you're a 2020 we have our first set of quarterfinals from the weekend obviously we knew from yesterday today let's begin with the game that we just saw as belgium defeat the defending holding champions portugal cristiano ronaldo bowing out one nothing the hammer of thor torgan hazard makes it one nothing what do you think of the game my friend I was a bit surprised. I'll start there because these were two of the highest scoring teams in the tournament and we were treated to a 1-0 game, which was a lot disappointing, a little deflating in some ways. You know, we were all very eager. I will say, though, the last 15, 20 minutes was popping off. Yeah. <laughs> when Pepe started fouling people and taking cheap shots and all that. T- Listen, that's what I hear for. That's what I love when the games get chippy. I love that in particular. I used to love those environments when I played in it because it wasn't about anything else anymore. It felt really personal when games got chippy. It wasn't about the crowd or, or even really the team you were representing. It was just like, I want to be better than that bastard over there wearing yeah. that. It got very South American, didn't it, Jimmy? I, love, oh, <laughs> I was loving it. I was loving it. And so I wish that spice, that little juice was earlier in the game. It just took too long, I think, for these two teams. But let's be honest, we've already seen it for pretty much all the round of 16 games, not only isolated here to the Euros, but, but also to any tournaments. Once you get into these must-win one-off games, it always gets a little bit tighter. It always Nobody wants to take that risk. Everybody's a little bit more conservative, including the managers, in terms of their player selection or whatever it may be. So fair play to Belgium for, for getting through, but just to get ahead of it for their game against Italy, the first quarterfinal that has been set. Without Kevin De Bruyne, potentially Eden Hazard, who came off of the hamstring thing, it could be a big, tall order for them to get past the Italians, who I think got a little lucky to survive Austria, but sometimes you need a little bit of luck to win anything. Yeah, no, absolutely. We'll talk about that uh, quarterfinal second, a very tasty matchup, of course. But to your point, and both, by the way, both of us, Jimmy and myself, we said that it was going to be a low scoring affair, Belgium against Portugal, just because, to your point, round of 16 matches, the, you know, the, the moment the knockout stage enters, you, it's not going to be this goal fest that everybody expects. I thought it was a really ugly game since the goal. I, th- I thought, like, <laughs> since the goal, it was so terrible <laughs> it was so sloppy there was no flow it was uh, i think people just like to your point i think people just got into their heads and then you know certain players were like too afraid of making a mistake they didn't want to make a mistake you know one team wanted to hold on to their lead and the other one wanted to carefully step by step try and get a goal back I, it wasn't until the final moments to your point again and since pepe you know, things got a little chippier and, and that kind of second guessing went out the window. It was all about, we need to get this victory. Renato Sanchez, once again, my friend, uh, a really good player for Portugal. I thought, uh, I thought Courtois was really good. Obviously Hazard with his goal, but anybody that uh, spoke out to you in that game? <sighs> it's tough. You know, when I look at the stats in this one, I'm actually quite surprised. I hadn't looked at it yet, but only six shots in total for Belgium, only one on target. And that was the goal. Uh, Portugal, obviously getting a lot of their stats there towards the back end when they were throwing everything at it, but they had 23 shots and only four on target. Pretty surprising given the, the amount of uh, attacking talent on display for both sides. And because when I looked at Belgium in particular, and I think this is another weak link for them, they have Alderweireld, Spurs player, yeah. Vermaelen, former Arsenal player, Vertonghen, former Spurs player. Like it was all like a North London derby in their back line, yeah. and all those guys are slow. And I thought that Portugal thirty didn't... plus, right? So yeah. yeah, yeah, and Portugal didn't really match up very well because Ronaldo's not going to outrun anybody anymore. Bernardo Silva, that's not his game. He looks to drop into midfield to create numerical advantages. And I thought Jota might have been the only guy that could help stretch that back line. And I think that is going to hurt 
or did ultimately, uh, that's what hurt Portugal, not figuring out a way to do that. And then obviously when Belgium scored first, and it allows them to now sit back with a, with their back five and, and then with a double pivot and, and not take as many risks. And that's why I think the game got a little bit slower. And of course, Kevin De Bruyne going out who can play through the lines that can transition and make special things happen. When he goes out and you bring on somebody who's not as good as he is, the game's going to get a bit stifled there too. My big issue though with Portugal and rest in peace to them after winning the, you know, not, not defending their title after winning it in 2016, they just didn't roll out the same 11 mm. and, and, and they don't have to roll out like the same exact players, but, but I just felt like they lacked an identity here. Yeah. And, no cohesion too. Yeah. Yeah. They had the double pivot. They went with Danilo and Carvalho in front of that back four for the first two games. Then uh, Carvalho made way for Renato Sanchez, as he should, because Sanchez came on and did very well as a super sub. But they only had one that really sat in front of that back four. And then they rolled out that same lineup uh, or the same midfield again. But then they had a different right back. Semedo wasn't in. I know he was hurt, but he wasn't playing well in particular. And it just felt like they really couldn't get going. And, and they obviously have more than enough talented players to, to get results. And I think they, they, they showed that. But when it really came down to breaking down another team in meaningful moments, they just didn't have it or didn't have that composure when they needed it. And, and I just feel like they lacked a little bit of identity. And sometimes that happens when you have some older guys that are kind of still holding on and, and everything revolves around them. I'm looking at Pepe and, and Cristiano Ronaldo in particular. And the younger guys just don't have room to kind of take over because these guys are such I don't know, alpha male seems hard, but they're, 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 they're such big presences. You know, they have such big personalities and everything has been about them for so long it's hard to really chip away at that. So I'm kind of curious as to when Cristiano Ronaldo steps uh, down, if he ever does, and and allows these other really talented young Portuguese players to come in and really take over. Yeah, that's not happening anytime soon. (laughs) He's going to stick around. Uh, To all your points, though, it's true. I think when you don't have cohesion, then you don't have rhythm, you don't have flow, and and it can be harder to create uh, not just numerical advantages, but also like, you know, creativity up top. And the other thing as well is, and I've said this a lot, I, I know, a broken record, whatever. I, I, they're, they're a very reactive team. They react a lot as opposed to like just imposing their own identity to your point. And when you don't have one, it can be difficult. But anyway, well done to Belgium. This to me, we talked about it on HQ with Poppy, like this to me, they need to win this. Like if they, you know, because this golden generation is fading. Look at my light falling away. See, my, my ring light is agreeing with me. It was falling down. Um, but I believe that Belgium need to win this and they need to do it well against an Italian side that's probably going to test everything. And finally, no Kevin De Bruyne, like you said, maybe. We don't know. I don't know what's going to happen there. Eden Hazard with a hamstring problem. That's going to be not going to be cured till mm-hmm. Friday. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, very quick, very instinctive. Who's winning that? I got Italy. I do think that they're going to find a way to make that happen. I just think there are some vulnerabilities with Belgium, that back line, like I mentioned. Not that Italy have out out and out speed up top. And Mobile is not going to necessarily outrun anybody either. But I just think in terms of an identity, Italy know who they are a little bit better than than Portugal did at this current moment. And the Austria yeah. game, though, Jimmy, they, they didn't look that great. No, uh, they didn't. They didn't. And, but and I maybe wonder, it was a good test. Yeah. I wonder if Mancini goes back to Locatelli because Verratti didn't look like he was 100%. So yeah. I'm kind of curious. But that said, they might get Chiellini back on the team. I just think there's more to like about Italy. And like I mentioned before, if you're going to go make a run to the final of any major tournament, you're going to have one game that you got lucky to survive. And yeah. I'm thinking that was Italy's. And I just think they're going to show up for this one. That said, uh, Romelu Lukaku and either playing in Italy or maybe facing the Italians, the guy's just a different level when Italy, the <laughs> word Italy's involved. So yeah. he might put his, the team on his back and make it happen. Thorgan Hazard has obviously been very good uh, as well, even if Eden or Kevin De Bruyne don't play. But uh, yeah, it's going to be a great one. I, I'm, I'm already thinking about the under two and a half goals in this one. <laughs> well, well, there you have it. There you have it. But yes, Lukaku against Italian opponents, always a good thing. And by the way, he was a little frustrated today, so I'm sure he's going to want to you know, do something extra in the quarterfinals. All right, let's keep going here. Czech Republic. Czech Republic. Well, we should have followed history, everybody, because Czech Republic have the Netherlands number. Talk about a bogey team against, you know, somebody. The Netherlands, they lost in Euro 2004. That was like the Nedved, Milan Barosh years. Uh, The Euro 2016 qualifiers, they had their number there as well. And once again, and I feel like, Jimmy, our Frank DeBoer 
uh, justification was proven. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to. I don't want to completely blame him. But what would you make of that? As the Czech Republic beat the Netherlands, make it through, and they'll be facing Denmark in the quarterfinals. Talk to me. Yeah, this is, this is an interesting one. We talked about in our preview of the round of 16 that there were a few teams that needed to score that first goal that were going to sit back and make it very difficult. Austria was one of them. We saw them do it against Italy. We thought Czech Republic was going to be another. I'd say Switzerland against France that's happening tomorrow would be another where the other team is, I would say, clearly better, but they have to know that the other team is probably better in almost every area and every facet. But if you have that team spirit, if you have that collectiveness, and everybody's working together and rowing the boat in the same direction. And you always give yourself a chance. And I thought we saw that from the Czechs. I thought they were very good and very disciplined defensively. We mentioned as well that Vasilik and goal is a tremendous player. And he ended up making a big save that ended up, I think, pr proving to be the biggest difference. Yeah. Daniel Malin went in 1v1. And then amazing later, stop. Amazing. Amazing stop. Right. And yeah. you need those. Right. But, but I think what's most fascinating outside of that 1v1 play is that despite before they went down a man, they, they didn't register any shots on goal the whole game, the Dutch. Mm. And that was really surprising to me. And I think, I don't want to take anything away from the Czechs, but there are some questions that I have of the Dutch for not being able to, to really push on and, and create some meaningful chances. That said, the Czechs made a big save when it needed to be made. And then a minute later, I think De Ligt made a bad decision. He got caught in two minds, like whether to attack the ball or let it bounce. Always, they tell you when you're a defender, you never let the ball bounce because then that gives the attacker another opportunity. Yep. to maybe No even second bounces. And, and then he was in oh shit mode and then, then it was trouble and he had to do what he had to do and yeah. it, it didn't work out for them and fair play to Czech Republic. Some teams don't take advantage of that. Some teams don't take a advantage of the man advantage and the Czechs did and uh, it was a set piece as well where that's got to be pretty disappointing for the Dutch. And if I'm DeBoer, which this isn't really on DeBoer, I thought his, I actually didn't mind his player selection per se, but, but. When you have a team and you're down to 10 men, you can't give up a goal on a set piece. You cannot. I mean, that is all just focus and, and determination and drive. It has nothing to do with talent or any of that. So that will be pretty disappointing, I think, for Frank DeBoer and his staff and, and for the team overall, because that's something they should be able to handle no matter what. And, and they didn't make it happen. And that's what unlocked it. And then it was all Czech Republic from there. And I, I, I actually thought the Dutch were going to get to the semis. We talked about it. I thought they were going to make a run. We did. Yeah. Their, their side of the group seems relatively quote unquote easy, but it's never easy in, in big competitions and must win games. Absolutely. Especially in your 2020 when the you know margin of error is so mm -hmm. thin, but well done to the Czech Republic. Do you think that the three five two formation was a little bit of an issue in this one? I mean, you know, sometimes I feel that when you play that formation, the moment you are in the midst of defensive transition, that's when you're you're most vulnerable. And that's what happened to Delict. I mean he did slip but I'm wondering if the extra cover, if you are right back, oh my God, ring light, you're so annoying. What do you think? Do you're you still think handsome though. Don't worry about it. You're <laughs> yeah. still handsome. Lisa. The ring light can't handle it. No, uh, I can't. Do you think a 4-3-3 would have helped? Do you think that that has a factor at all? I, I think you have to look at it and question it for sure. And whether, or, well, let me say it like this, how it matched up with the Czech Republic, who looked like they were in a 4-2-3-1 and yeah. almost were prepared for this formation from the Dutch that, that no, they just haven't played. They didn't grow up in that system. They're not thinking in a, you know, in a three, five, two or whatever you want to call it, three, four, one, two, and having the two wing backs, the three center yeah. backs. So, so yeah, I think there's things you could poke at. I didn't mind his lineup. They had been playing really well in the group stages. I can understand why you wanted to continue to roll with it, but we ran into, or he, they ran into a Czech team that, that was prepared and, and really kind of blocked the spaces that maybe they were accustomed to in the group stages that other teams didn't have answers for. I will say when I look at the back three, you got DeVry, Delict, Daily Blint. Not very quick, right? Not going to really contribute much to the attack. Dumfries, I thought, was very good. I think he's going to be a player that people... He got on the radar of a lot of big clubs now. I, I, I would think he surprised. has a 15 million euro release clause. Which is insane, by yeah. the way. So I think he'll, that'll be released by somebody because I thought he really showed... Van Anholt, who I really like as well, those guys are still outside backs, mm. right? I mean, all, at the end of the day, they're still outside backs. So for you to now expect them to just bomb forward and be the guys going and really generate an attack for you, I felt a little unfair... So if you had one of those guys or both of them, but took out a center back, maybe the balance of the team would have been a little bit better. Maybe the spacing that they were used to and, and grew up with would be there in, in a different way. Now, obviously, we're talking about world-class players that should be able to adapt to whatever situation. But that said, there is a certain identity that the Dutch have, and they got away from it from this tournament. They look good in the group stages. One bad mistake, one miss, 1v1, and we're talking about how, man, they shouldn't have been doing that. Had it gone the other way, and Daniel Mellon would have scored that. Maybe we're talking a, a, or singing a different tune.
Yeah, well, now they face Denmark. And my, I mean, you, you tweeted Denmark are going to the final. I, I tell did, you I what, did. it's not that insane right now to, you know, when Kasper Schmeichel said, we're going to win this whole thing for Christian Eriksen. Listen, I'm starting to believe him right now. Like, uh, who knows, right? Okay, so obviously you said in the previous app, emotionally, you know, your, your father's Danish, you got Danish blood and you, you still got, you still going with that? Yeah, of course. I think it's all setting up. You know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, but they're just getting kind of lucky with how the draw is setting up. When I look at what they did and, and how they beat Wales and how they beat Russia, they pivoted from a back four to a back three with two wingbacks, just like we saw with the Dutch. But in, in, I guess in somewhat of a compare and contrast with the Dutch, they have turned that into eight goals over the last two games. And so it's clearly working for them in some capacity. Now, the Czech Republic just, just showed that they know how to break that down. They know how to absorb against a team that's set up that way. So it'll be interesting to see if Denmark changes to a back four, which I thought they played really well against Belgium in that back four. They ultimately lost, but they came out really, really well. I think there's something about this Danish vibe, though. We're 29 years removed from when they won the Euros in 1992 with a team that had nothing to lose and everything to gain. And we're just happy to be there. And I feel like there's a similar type of vibe. It's not like for like, obviously there was no Christian Eriksen incident back in 92, right. but, but there's still something about, you know, they have that perspective of there are bigger things in life than us just playing. Let's just go out and have some fun that other teams can't replicate because they didn't go through that Christian Eriksen situation. So yeah, I, I like them to beat Czech. I mean, even if let's say, leave that, leave the, the Christian Eriksen stuff out on paper, Denmark, I think, are a better team than Czech Republic. Yeah, match up for match up. They match up. So, so yeah. they've got that going for them. And then I think they could just ride this wave of, of whatever's going on internally for them, both individually and collectively. And as a country, uh, I think they could really parlay that into a, a couple more couple more games in this tournament. Yeah, no, well said. And the only other thing that I'll say is that it's probably going to be the widest quarterfinal ever. I mean, it's Chris, you know, Czech Republic against Denmark. It's just like a lot of real white... European, it's good. They need to hand themselves <laughs> off it for it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. Uh, be, I think it's gonna be a very physical game is what I think. Uh, but you know, one of the things that you just said, when you have to climb that emotional mountain at some point, right. It's going to help you. It's like, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger basically. Mm -hmm. And, and I feel that that's what Denmark's still going through, but Patrick Schick, man, four goals already. That boy can score. I know. And he is now one goal off of Cristiano Ronaldo for the golden boot. And now Ronaldo's out. So I know that's what I'm, I, I don't know if he's going to do it. I had Lukaku if Belgium won. I thought Lukaku and you said it on HQ today that, but I thought Lukaku would score today and, and uh, he didn't, but he is a force to be reckoned with in so many different ways. His hold up play is fantastic. I really love his game, but I, I will say with regard to Denmark, they, they haven't shown it in this last game against Wales. They did. They have been so good in qualifying. Yeah. Uh, in either in the Nations League or World Cup qualifying defensively. And and I feel like they just tapped into that against Wales. And I think if they can isolate Patrick Schick, then they've got a great chance. I mean, when, before Holes scored on the set piece, Schick was the only goal scorer for Czech Republic. Yeah. And now they've got two guys. But if you can really keep Schick quiet, which is not easy, obviously, he's playing with a ton of confidence, then that gives Denmark a great chance. And Denmark can hurt you in so many different ways. So I like I like the Danes to get to the semifinals. I'm not afraid to put my my flag on the ground and, and stand by that. No, listen, it could very well happen. Now we will see what happens and tweet us. What do you think? Let me check out. Hey, Jimmy Conrad, Kego Lasso pod. Cause you have some quarterfinals to look ahead to. All right. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll quickly give you a preview of Monday's action. Cause you got Spain against Croatia and France against Switzerland. Kego Lasso will be right back. Hey everybody, welcome to Kigo Lasso. And by the way, uh, we're, we're doing this as I'm watching Peru against Venezuela. So if I, if you hear like some combustion of screaming at some point, <laughs> okay, that is the reason why. But anyway, welcome Euro 2020 previewing Monday's action. Let's begin Jimmy Conrad with Croatia against Spain. They have met twice before at Euro 2012, 2016, I think shared by each where Spain won in 2012 and Croatia in 2016. Obviously, this is different. Uh, despite the fact that Croatia made it to the World Cup final in 2018, a few of those players have left, so they're still figuring themselves out. Spain finally woke up in the last game against Slovakia. Uh, and, you know, for those XG, I know our friends at CBSports.com, my Goodman, Igor, will be happy about this. Uh, James Bench will love this, but obviously uh, Spain boasted a higher expected goals ratio than anybody in the group stage, which doesn't surprise me 
uh, at all. But, you know, we will see what happens uh, in this one. A very tasty game. And to your point, Jimmy, I believe you said in our round of 16 preview, this is the one that you're looking forward to the most. It is. And I'm going to echo those same sentiments that these two teams, I thought, played very, very well. Their best game so far in the tournament in their last group game. So Croatia looked excellent against Scotland. They had to battle back a little bit, but Luka Modric's goal was sublime and what a player. And uh, they just showed their quality, I think, in their experience and, and the fact that they've been here before. Spain, on the other hand, obviously, you know, a lot of jokes, a lot of memes built around how they can't score, especially penalties. They also played very, very well. It was against Slovakia. They got a little bit of help from Martin Dabrowska, who who decided to slam dunk one into his own goal. So fair play to him. That was the craziest own goal I've seen in some some time. And they needed a little bit of that luck to just relax. And I think the Spanish team, and I think you mentioned it before, Luis Enrique compared them to a you know a bottle of champagne. Once they they opened it up, then all the fun's gonna happen. Let's party, you know. So what, I'm interested to see because these two teams I thought played their best. And they're playing against each other. I'm like, wow, what a draw. So I'm yeah. kind of curious who can carry that momentum. And the fact that I'm on William Hill right now, looking at the odds, plus 550 for Croatia to, to win straight up. What? Yeah. I mean, put some respect on Croatia's name. Yeah, that's you know, not, that's crazy. Spain are heavy favorites, minus 167. And there is something to be said for experience. And, and I also want to add with regard to Spain in particular, they're another team very similar to Portugal that I don't think they know who their best 11 is. Mm. And I don't think, or, or when Luis Enrique picks a player to start, that player doesn't perform or they don't score. Or they don't take their, their chances or, you know, whatever it may be that he just hasn't found that right concoction of players. They don't always have to be your most talented, but who are the best 11 that, yeah. that you can get the most out of and help you get results. And I'll give you a fun right. part to just echo what you just said. Uh, he was asked by a reporter today, is there any uh, shot that you'll be making some changes to your side? And Luis Enrique was like, it's possible, but it's all, <laughs> and then he goes, but it's also, and then he's like waiting for the reporter to answer. And the reporter goes, also not possible. And then he's like, bravo. <laughs> so, so Luis Enrique being Luis Enrique. And to your point, yes, uh, Spain still don't know in many ways who Spain is. And that's a big problem when you face a Croatian side, who, by the way, made the final of the World Cup in 2018. I know, I know it's been a few years, but like you said, put some respect on Croatia's name. So what do you think? What do you think is going to be the outcome of this one then? I just don't think Croatia are going to be easy to beat. They were down 1-0 to the Czech Republic, who just won today. We talked about them. And they came back. Perisic scored right after halftime. That was their first goal of the tournament. They didn't look great against England. I guess my only fear about the Croatia we saw in the first two games is that they didn't ever look like they were going to go on to win it. It was almost like they were lined up not to win those games. They weren't trying to win those. And then when they finally had to win a game against Scotland, I feel like we finally saw the version of Croatia that we need to see the rest of the tournament. And yeah. they went out and won it. And, and they had to battle a little bit, right? Scots are going to fight and scratch for everything. And they wore down the Scots. And the game was in Scotland, in Glasgow. And, and they still went out and got a result. And I think that speaks a lot about their quality in a lot of different ways. Now, I don't want to take anything away from Spain. I, I think they're going to have probably 70% possession. It's just, what are they going to do least. with that possession? At least. What are they going to do with that? Croatia is one of those teams who, okay, if you want to have the ball, it's fine. That we'll, we'll give you the ball, but you're not going to have the ball in the areas that we want you to have the ball or yeah. that we're, we're scared of, of, of where you're going to get it. Yeah. And, and Control because, versus possession. Yeah. yeah. And because, and because the, you know, with regard to Spain in particular, they just, I mean, I look at their game against Slovakia and I see their lineups and yeah, they've been thumping a lot of people. You have Morata, you have Gerard Moreno, like those guys aren't confident right now they're not they're not Patrick Schick you know I'm going to use a compare and contrast somebody who's just he's just he's just on the end of things he's finding himself in great spots he's he's making that commitment to potentially get there because he knows you know what I'm going to score this one these other guys are like I hope I score this one yeah and there's a big distinguish between uh, distinguishing or uh, distinction excuse me between knowing you're going to score and hoping you score and I feel like the Spanish team are more in the hope department but maybe after scoring five goals that will help them relax a little bit. But this Croatia team, I don't think you can sleep on them. So this is a long way of me saying that I'm actually leaning towards the draw. And then when it goes into extra time, it can be wide open from there. If it goes to penalties, Spain's got no chance because clearly they can't make them. <laughs> but but I could see Croatia being tough enough to, and then based on a lot of the things we've seen, a lot of games that have been super tight, I could see Croatia really just absorbing, absorbing, absorbing. 
and then we'll see what happens. If it's if, honestly, if it went zero zero in this one, I wouldn't be surprised. I could see a one one as well. Yeah. The draw the draw and under two and a half goals is plus three hundred. Well, plus, I think there's your ticket. Plus two seventy right. is the draw though. If you just want the draw straight up, plus two seventy is probably the safer. It's just so in case you could do two, two right. Two, Chances of probability is what we always say here. That's true. But the draw and under two and a half goals is plus three hundred. Uh, if you like, I'll just give you the thing. Spain in the win over two and a half goals is the favorite plus one sixty three. Spain and win, them winning under two and a half goals plus 230. Then the draw is the third favorite. Croatia to win in under two and a half goals is plus 900. I mean, Croatia, Croatia to win in over two and a half goals is plus 1100. I don't feel like Croatia is getting that much respect. And so ab- there's a, absolutely there's a, correct. They're not getting nowhere near as much respect. Um, so I'm so, kind of looking at the over under here, but a lot of games have been tight outside of the Denmark Wales game. Everything else has been. Uh, pretty tight under under two and a half goals so listen everything that you just said i completely agree i think it's going to be a draw i think it's going to be nil nil i think it'll take us to extra time the only outcome is that i see spain doing it but i'm not that's that fair. Co- that's fair but i'm not that confident on it because the other thing that i think is worth mentioning by the way is sometimes you have to look at the blueprint of the tournament from both teams and what i mean by that is croatia's journey up to here has been a little bit tougher They had to face England. They had to face a scrappy Scotland, to your point, right? Uh, Czech Republic. Spain really had no business drawing two games in their group, okay? With all due respect to Sweden, uh, Slovakia, and Poland, Poland. right? So obviously they destroyed Slovakia, but the first two games. So that tells me a little bit, right? You know, if you, you know, Croatia has gone through a little bit of a harder journey. So they've seen right? England like to keep the ball, especially in the midfield. So they've seen a similar sort of pattern. So I'm wondering to your point, it's like, we don't need to have the ball, but we'll control in the specific moments. I just think that it's going to be a very tight game. There will be no goals in regular time. It will go to extra time. And that's why I think Spain will win. But if it goes to penalties, to your point, my friend, I mean, (laughs) then I do worry for (laughs) España. Yeah, I worry for them too. I worry for them too when it comes to that. It, it's what I, I guess we haven't discussed is the fact that Spain have only given up one goal. And that needs to be discussed because Laporte's in the team. Obviously, no Sergio Ramos was the big talking point prior to this. Yeah, no, it's Mark good. Torres, but, Laporte, but they're Llorente, good. Not that being that good though, Jimmy, though. I, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. I think you can go at them a little bit. And, and Poland did try to take it to him a little bit, but and by the way, this is me saying that Spain's going to win this game. But like, I, I don't think I think that the journey that Croatia has gone through in the group stages is a little bit tougher than Spain's. Uh, yes, but yes, I agree. So, so it's a Spain coin toss to me. Yeah. Spain had seventy-seven percent possession, possession, excuse me, versus Poland, 86 percent possession against Sweden, which is unheard of. And yeah, then they had, <laughs> and they had a uh, 66% possession against Slovakia. Didn't yeah. give up a shot at all to them. So whenever Sweden had the ball, it's cause you know, uh, Olsen was taking a goal kick. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the thing. I mean, Croatia is going to have to make a lot with, a, with a little yeah. and, and they have the players to do it. It's just a matter where they set up, how they absorb and where they think they can sting them. I do think on set pieces, Croatia does have a bit of an advantage, but they have to earn those set pieces. So it's going to be interesting to see. I actually thought when I look at the Croatia team, who I thought was very good in particular was, um, and he was important against Scotland. Uh, I just clicked off of it, was their number nine up top. Uh, it was Pekovic, who mm-hmm. I thought he was fantastic. I thought he brought players into the team. I thought that he allowed the team to transition in a more meaningful way. And I, he just got himself in good spots to make plays. And and I think if he can continue to do that against the Spanish team, that's going to allow Croatia to create some more opportunities and, and put some pressure on Spain. Otherwise, it's just a matter of whether Spain's going to make a mistake and Croatia can pounce on that one. It's a tough one, though. I feel like the under is the play here. It's just a matter of where your heart's leaning, everybody. Yeah, no, absolutely right. All right, let's move on and finish everything with France against Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland, by the way, have reached the knockout stages at each of their past four major tournaments. So it's not like this is a main shocker. They're in the knockout stages in the round 16. They were eliminated in their first game following the group stages on each of those previous three instances. So they just get better as the tournament goes along. France have only lost one of their previous 17 games at the Euros and World Cup combined. That's 12 wins, four draws. The Euro 2016 final against Portugal was obviously uh, that loss. Switzerland is going to face uh, this reigning champion for the very first time in a major tournament. So they don't really have anything to go behind. 
Uh, I, France is winning this. Yes, Jimmy Conrad? Yeah, yeah, they're winning. It's the long way, right? And forget about all the stats. I will say, though, Jimmy, that I was reading some reports about how the French squad, apparently, after that draw with Portugal, they're asking Didier Deschamps to revert to that 3-4-3. Three, three. They weren't feeling too comfortable in that game against Portugal. And I wonder if Didier Deschamps will grant the wishes, especially against the side with all due respect that it's not necessarily as strong as Portugal. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I find that interesting, though, that the French players asked for that. I think that's a sign of maturity. I think that's a sign of knowing. Yeah, keep reported that, by the way. Just wanted yeah, to. Yeah, the, 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 the fact that they know who they are and, and the best positions for them to succeed. So, yeah, I like that. I like that there's some leadership there and that they feel comfortable enough to go approach their coach and say, Hey, we actually feel like we move and we transition better in this team shape. So that doesn't bode well for the Swiss. <laughs> and I said this before in our preview that France haven't played their best, but yet they were still on top of the group of death. And I think that yep, matters. Very good point. I, I think that that means something. Uh, and, and because Switzerland, when they did play their only really good team in their group, they lost three zero to Italy. Yeah. I just, it doesn't look good for the Swiss. That said, they do fall into that category, very similar to Austria, who I thought played extremely well against Italy and made them work to get that result. And Czech Republic today against the Netherlands, who they weren't the favorites clearly to, to do anything. And they won 2-0 and obviously got a little bit of fortune, some good saves, but, but they fall into that category for me that they're going to have to have some superb tactics. They're going to have to have the other team in this particular instance, France not show up and have a good game. France, I think, is due to have a good game. Kylian Mbappe has yet to score so far in this tournament. He seems like he's he's itching to do something big, especially in the knockout rounds. You know, he really put a stamp on being one of the best young players, not only the best young player, but one of the best players in the world, which I think he's already proven, but it helps to do it in major competition. So yep. I like France all day, every day. My big question for everybody listening and for you, Luis, because I'm on the fence, is do we think the Swiss are going to score? Mm. Because obviously that influences a lot of different things in terms. Well, what does William Hill say? Because, you know, there's no doubt that we think France is going to win, depending on how overwhelming the victory will be, will say something. A very good point about Kylian Mbappé, who hasn't scored yet. And I, I, he knows that. He sees that. And especially he's looking at the knockout stage right now as a, as a major thing. What do you think? I, well, I, honestly, I, have, I have a score in my head, Jimmy, but I want to know what you say. I'm, I'm working through this with everybody listening because... I do think France is going to win. So I can just put that out there. Yeah, that's, that's how that's the quest, yeah. But France is minus 167. You guys know that I don't like to bet the negatives. That's no fun. We want to go for some value and, and uh, mix it up a little bit. Swiss are 550 to win straight up and the draws plus 270. Feels very similar to the Croatia game, but I can't believe Croatia is going off at that, those types of numbers. Yeah. Uh, the over, over two and a half goals is plus 110. I don't know how I feel about that one in particular because France won one with Hungary. 1-0 over Germany, you know, a 2-2 game where a bunch of penalties were called. In, they're in due the then, France. They're due, Jim. They're, they're either due or they're, it's going to stay a <laughs> oh, trend. That's trend. the hard yeah. part. Don't talk me out of it, Luis. Stop talking <laughs> me out of it. So, so, okay, so, okay, fine, fine. So what it, are you it, telling me? What are you well, telling everybody? Well, what right now I look at killing Mbappe to score anytime plus 130 just because he's due. If you think, you know what, not only is Mbappe going to score, he's going to be first, be the first goal scorer, plus 350. I had Memphis Depay. I'll raise my hand. I had Memphis Depay scoring first today. He wasn't as active, and that's due to the Czech Republic. If that red card didn't happen, then maybe Depay would have got there. I had Netherlands to win in the under. That almost all, all that hit until Delict got or was looking to look possibly hit. So, yeah. you know, it's a real thin, thin line between success and failure, as you mentioned. But I'm just thinking killing Mbappe to do something. With regard to the Swiss, will they score? They don't really excite me. So when I go to some of the team props here, you know, if you want um, – France to win with a clean sheet. That's plus 130. I hit that one with Denmark versus Wales. I could see France really locking things down, especially if they're going to a formation that they feel good about and where they didn't give up too many chances, uh, unlike what they did against uh, Portugal in particular. So I like that one. Plus 130 feels like the nice safe bet. You don't have to worry so much um, about whether they get over or under or both teams to score. Obviously, you don't want them to give up anything to the Swiss, but I think they have enough to get a goal. And it's one of those moments, right, where... Hey, France, if you want to win this tournament, show it. Yeah, show it. Then you should be able to beat Switzerland in 90 minutes. You should be able to score against the Swiss. And that's kind of how I package some of my thoughts sometimes. And so I'd be leaning towards that one. So France to win with a clean sheet plus uh, 130. And then honestly, I love the half props. There's some great value here. And what I've seen from France 
or just in a lot of these games, especially in the round of 16, they've been very tight in the first half. So I kind of like the draw of the first half and then France come in with their quality and their depth and win the second half. I feel like that was the difference between Italy and Austria is that Italy just had some depth and can bring on some absolute ballers where Austria is like, yeah, we're just going to hold on for 90 minutes and hope for the best, you know? And, and they did obviously take it to extra time. But I think that that depth in France's is tremendous, could could win out. So you could have a draw in the first half, France win the second half plus 300. That's something That's to good. consider. Or or you think that France is going to come out and try to step on their throats and then take their foot off for the second one or just lock it down. France to win the second half, first half, and the draw of the second half is plus 400. Or you could do a, a probability bet like we did, you can do. We can have France win both, both halves. That's plus 340. I don't know. There's a whole bunch of fun stuff on William Hill. I just want you guys to think about where honestly, you should really just think, do I believe that Swiss are going to score or not? I'm leaning towards them not being able to score in this one. I just don't know how many goals France are going to score. I don't know if they're going to light them up, but I do like Kylian Mbappe to, to somehow show up and, and get his first goal at the tournament. All right, Jamie, can I tell you, after everything you just said, this is what I have, and it hasn't changed since you just talked to me, and there's some great bets that can help that. 3 nothing France. Switzerland's not winning this. They're ready. <laughs> they're ready to go off. Kylian Mbappe will score first. I, that's how strong I feel about it. Okay. Okay. But not with anybody else's money. So you please uh, listen to Jimmy instead of me. I just, it's time for France to wake up. It's time for France to show why they're France. And I feel that this is the moment. And Kylian Mbappé, he knows he hasn't scored yet. He, he needs to do it. Benzema had his moment. Griezmann has had his moment. It's time for Mbappé to have his moment once again. I feel that this is it. I like the idea of France winning both halves, Mbappé scoring. I think that's good. But you gave so many there uh, that I think our friends, uh, you know, can take a lot of advantage. Of. Yeah, for sure. I guess another one that I like, too, is the total goals. And they give okay. you multi, multi goals. I've been doing this a lot with my NWSL betting, and it hits quite a bit. So if you say one to two goals total in this game, that's plus 100. Two to three goals, also plus 100. If you think three to six goals, which would be crazy, that's a lot, plus 120. And it just kind of goes up from there. I mean, if you want to get even more specific, you're going to get better value on that. Like if you think total match goals is just two, that's plus 230. I mean, there's all different types. I love uh, just the, all the exotics here on William Hill. But, yeah, but just put a little bit on a, a bunch. Is, is, that's the way to do it. I mean, yeah, you just put like, you know, five, 10 bucks on each one. Yeah. And, and no, I was going to say 500. Yeah. Of, <laughs> whoa, okay. All right, big guy. But yeah. uh, correct score, France 500 three, zero. pennies, Jimmy. <laughs> If you put ten dollars, if you bet ten dollars on France winning three zero, that'll get you a hundred bucks, ten to one. See, there you go. And what if you put a score in there and you put Mbappe? Yeah, I, they don't give you that one. They wouldn't oh, allow okay. me. Okay. They 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 usually give that to me for the club stuff for Champions League, but they don't give that as an option in this one for yeah. whatever reason. Well, ten bucks, a hundred, that's fine. Listen, if you want to do the exact score, you guys know that I like doing that. I would probably put France 1 0 plus 450. I'll put 10 bucks on that. And France 2 0, 10 bucks on that plus 550. So I'd be a winner either way. 45 bucks or 55 coming my way. Still, still a net gain. Jimmy, even without this game, you're a winner. Okay. So <laughs> just remember that. So, uh, uh you well, sound like my mom. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we just texted. So she was like, make sure you tell Jimmy. Well, why are you texting my mom, dude? That's yeah, messed okay. up. <laughs> yeah. That, was, that, that made a weird turn. <laughs> Or maybe it didn't. Are you my are you my dad? <laughs> yeah, this is the big reveal. <laughs> yeah. After 100 uh, episodes of the podcast, we have a big reveal. It's why you're trying to learn Spanish. All right. Hey, everybody. Well, that's it. That's our show. Jimmy Conrad brought it once again. Thank you so much, my friend. Final thoughts before we say goodbye. Thanks for being my dad, Luis. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> She's been it. <laughs> I'm not picking you up from pickup. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, thank you so much, brother. All right, thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. You guys are so weird. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everybody, I want to thank Jimmy Conrad for joining me today. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Que Golazo Pod. We are also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Que Golazo. That's where you subscribe and you watch every single video. We're on cbssports.com and your CBS Sports app. Enjoy the rest of Euro 2020. We have plenty more to come. Have a great day. 